we're chatting to Bradley August, the coach of Glendin uh, United Football Club. Uh, welcome, coach. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes, coach. Being here. Congratulations for being crowned the champions of the ABC Mutsepe League of Safa Western Cape. Uh, just share with us that journey with the club. Yeah, it's been tough. We started already last year already, and you know, COVID came and we were up, we were starting with the preseason already in September, October, and then then they said the league is going to start in December. Then it never started in December. Then we uh, January never started in January. Uh, then they said February. Then I think Salah Maposa moved us to level three, from level two to level three, and then we were not going to play. And then everything was a little bit more settled with the co with the COVID, and then he moved us back to level two, and then we could start uh, training. Um, and then um, he moved us back to level one, and then when things started to happen a little bit quicker with all the meetings and the teams starting to to join in, in terms of the new season. And then there was that big debate who was going to play and who was not going to play. Out of 18 teams, um, there was 10 teams that said they wanted to play. And from 10, it went to 9, and from 9, it went to 7. Yeah. And then we were sitting in a meeting, and then the, the coordinator of the league said, for any league to start, for any league to happen, there must be 9 plus, uh, nine plus 1. Yeah. Um, and then that was the decision that was made. And then, you know, and as time go went on, a lot of teams started to withdraw because a lot of teams was thinking about um, with the COVID and, and how you can control the games and the gates and the training sessions and, you know, and so on. And then there were seven teams that said yeah. they want to play. And then the director came from Safa National to say, look, Cape Town must have a representative when we go to the playoffs. So that seven teams, unfortunately, have to play. And that's how the, the seven teams started to prepare and started to play. You know, there was a few workshops and so on because of um, um, the COVID and how we're going to handle the training sessions and the games and the change rooms and the balls and, the, and so on. You know, a lot of work went into it. Wow. So uh, as you were preparing and because the go-ahead was then given and rules were thrown out of the window in this instant. How difficult was it for you to get the players mentally prepared, um, having to adhere to the protocols of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, it became, it became a new norm, you know, uh, coming to training, telling players, um, so our, our players come to training with their cars, telling them to, when they come to training, uh, put their mask on, roll the windows down, um, Having social distance in the in the cars, not driving, um, not driving five in a car, driving three in a car, you know, and so on. So a lot of things went, a lot of work went into it, a lot of education went into it, and then it became the new norm, you know, coming to training, uh, taking the temperature, sanitizing, not touching the balls, not touching the beacons, not touching the bubs. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff went into it, a lot of hard work, you know, a lot of hands, you know. Now, with your technical team, um, what plans did you set out? Because it looks like you you were quite consistent, um, even though maybe most of us were unable to watch the games because it was behind uh, closed doors, um, adhering to COVID-19 um, protocols. So your planning and your execution, uh, would you say that you got the best out of the players um, having to maybe adapt to the conditions, especially maybe in some instances you had positive cases? Uh, no, we had to, to to adapt to the situation, you know, of course. Um, we had to tell the players that their girlfriends and their family members couldn't come to the training sessions and couldn't come to the games, you know, which was difficult. It was only the two teams on a match day coming, arriving at the field. And uh, we would only allow us to be 30 in the field and the opposition only 30. And checks and temperatures and questions was asked at the gate before you could enter. And if, if your name was not on the list, or, then you could not come in, unfortunately, you know. We had some people outside of the facility supporting the team with banners and some of the girlfriends and, you know, but it, it wasn't easy. It, it was it was difficult, you know, but it, it had to be done. And I must sit here today and I could I can say proudly and I don't have to lie to say we didn't have any COVID cases yeah. um, from the time that we were training already last year until even now when we finished the season, there was no COVID cases, you know. So, I mean, so, well, you know, we did well, you know. Yeah. A lot of work went into it, a lot of 
a lot of talking and a lot of re reminding players, you know. And uh, you must un also understand guys come to training, guys come to games, doing all the checks, following protocols. But then after the training and after the games, they go home to their families and their friends and they go into their own community. So it's it's tough. And then they come back the next day to training. So, you know, anything can happen. But the boys did very, very well in terms of following the instructions and so on, you know, following protocol. So would you say that then also gave you an indication in terms of uh, discipline um, within the team, especially the players, that they are now limited into moving around, um, visiting, you know, going to a group of, uh, of, of people. Um, so because our understanding is that if you look at the, the amateur leg is that there, is, there isn't much that you can do to control the movement of players, especially in this pandemic. So maybe then that gave you a lot of lessons, not only you, but the players as well in terms of discipline and adhering to the training plan, you know, and what is required. Yeah, I think the guys did, um, they did listen and buy into what we, what we wanted to do, you know, with this whole COVID thing. So it was tough, you know, we had to, yeah, you know, uh, I had to talk to them every day before training and every day when we finished training to say, guys, you're going now home now um, to your families and your friends and, and so on, to your own communities. Just be careful, wear a mask, be disciplined, um, sanitize your hands, um, make sure you have social distance when you, you know, and so on. But the guys did well, you know, I must say that they did very well. There was a few cases um, in some um, in some other teams that I can, that I know of. So, I mean, I'm sitting here as a proud person to say, look, not one, we didn't have one case, you know. So, I mean, in that aspect, the boys did very, very well, you know. Yeah. They were disciplined, you know, they yeah. listened, you know, so. Was yeah. tough, you know. I mean, sometimes we would play friendly games when we play when we used to play friendly games away from home, and we still uh, need to remind them when they get out of the cars that you must put your mask on. You only take your mask on when you when you warm up and when you play. The guys that were sitting on the bench, in friendly games, they had to put on their mask and and so on, you know. So it was hard, but it you know we we we, we did well, you know. The guys the guys did well, we, you know the. My technical team did, did very, very well with, with all the work that went in behind the scenes, you know. Yeah. Let's chat about your technical team. And, and, and that is the group of people that you work with behind the scenes. Uh, would you say that when you set out the goals, having looked at the number of teams that would be participating, would you say that you're quite happy in terms of your performance and um, having been crowned as well the, the, the champions of the league? Yeah, I'm very, very much happy with my technical team. You know, we've got a small group. we only got five or six guys that are involved, that are running things from uh, behind the scenes, you know, um, and then, yeah, preparations went into the season to, you know, try to to win it, you know, with seven teams, you're playing 12 games, you've got a squad of 23 players, not every, not all the players are going to play, but, um, yeah, you know, there were some, some happy faces, you know, yeah. um, um, so, so, yeah, the league was tough, you know, I mean, seven, uh, seven teams, 12 games to play, there wasn't a lot of big scores in the league. There was only two big scores in the league in terms of score score line. FC Police went out by they lost six one or six 0 We went to Bradastop to play police. We we beat them five one. So that was the only two games where there was big scores. But all the other games was two one, three two, four three, one nil, one nil, one ones, two twos. So it was a tough league, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was a it was a difficult league. Twelve games, no room for error. Um, it was hard, you know, we lost our first game when we went to Paul, 4-2. Uh, um, and then after that, we went on, uh, 12 games, we went on an 11 yeah. um, unbeaten run, you know. Okay. Um, we conceded only seven goals, the least of all the, se the seven teams. Um, we never, we never, we never conceded one goal at home. So we've done, we, we did well, you know. Yeah. The guys did well, the players did fantastically, you know. Yeah. And coach, and uh, this was just the beginning to win the league. It's just a, a celebration that does not last because and there you are, you're getting ready for the playoffs. And we know what the playoffs, um, uh, how tough they are um, for the two clubs to be promoted into the NFD. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. Um, we only stopped last week when we played our last league game. And now we are preparing for the playoffs. And now um, we had, um, we, we, you know, Cape Town and South Africa has been hit by the third wave. Yeah. We are level three at the moment, so it's it's tough at the moment. So we are, a lot of preparations has gone into the is going into the playoffs. 
are we going to go? When are we going to go? We're waiting for the draw. We're waiting for, we know it's going to be in Pumalanga. Um, in terms of the date, we don't know yet. We're still waiting. But Wednesday, that's the uh, draw in Johannesburg. So, um, but hopefully by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we will know when is the play is going to be. But the venue is definitely going to be in um, Pumalanga province. So, um, yeah, a lot of work is going um, going um, in in terms of preparations for the for the for the for the team to go there and 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 and, and win promotion. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so that is what we are buzzing with, and then we are training also at the moment, you know, getting the guys ready in the right frame of mind, you know, in the right mental space to go to Pumalanga, yeah. to go and win. We know it's not going to be easy because uh, of the altitude. Um, going this time of the year to Pumalanga, I think it's winter, you know, you know. So um, yeah, playing away from playing away from home, you know, not playing in our own conditions. Yeah, yeah. Let's chat about your coaching journey. And and maybe you can tell us this, if this is your first time going into the playoffs as a coach. Um, you know, I know you were with Hout Bay at some stage, and um, this is probably like the biggest achievement for you to 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 have probably won the the ABC Mutep, and maybe that's probably one of the reasons you made that move in 2019 uh, to leave Hout Bay. Yeah, look, I was there in Hout Bay for two and a half years, and um, and I was very happy there. Um, and then, um, yeah, you just come to a time, you know, where you're thinking, look, maybe now it's maybe time to to take on another project, you know. Mm. And this is the project that I'm talking about, Green D now, you know. Mm. But I had some wonderful moments and some good times in Outbay. It was really fantastic, you know. Um, yeah, the guys there in Outbay, they, they gave they gave the all to me, you know. I mean, I had some good support, fantastic support from the owners. Supporters was fantastic on a Friday night when you used to play. Um, we promoted some young players, we developed some young players, they came through, through the under 18s, into the first team. And the guys did fantastically well there, you know. Yeah. But um, after two and a half years, you're thinking, look, what what can you give more, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, can you, can you, can you take it? Can you can continue, you know? Um, and then, you know, I decided to um, to move closer to home, you know. Um, I live in, in the Ottery area and the we train at Clendint and at Sakarot, so I'm five minutes away. So, yeah. and um, yeah, and you know, it was a tough decision to leave out by after two and a half years where we've we've built some w some wonderful friendship, also, you know. So, yeah, that was something that's that I'm always thinking about, you know, that yeah. there are a lot of work that we put into the out by project, you know, when I went there, you know. Um, yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Let's dive into your coaching journey. At what point when you were reaching your retirement um, stages as a football player where you sort of say, okay, you know, when I retire, I'm going into this direction and what probably like mostly influenced you to, to, to go that direction? Yeah, I've, I stopped um, playing when I was 32 years old, picked up an ankle injury, um, had to go for operation, did the operation, came back. There was opportunity for me to still play in the NFD at Vesco. I had to do preseason. You know, my ankle couldn't. You know, my my body hitting the thirty the thirty old mark is <laughs> yeah. not easy for a for a football player. You know. <laughs> and then I just thought, look, maybe it's time for me to to move in a different direction. You know. And then that's when it all started for me. Um, yeah, it started it started for me in Menenberg at Crystal Palace. Uh, start building a local team, winning the league. Going, going to the playoffs, winning the playoffs, going to the Castle League, winning the Castle League, uh, going to the playoffs, winning the playoffs, going to the Mochepe. And then I went for one season to Vesco da Gama in the NFD as assistant coach. Learned some wonderful things there, you know. And then I went to Glendin, went there the first year, won the league, went to Kimberley to the playoffs, we lost, came back. The second year didn't go so well, you know, and then I left. Stayed at home for three months, yeah. just refreshing, you know, myself up. Going to out by. Um, they played for two years in the Castle League. Fought the relegation for two years. The year that I just got there, the Castle League, the last season I got there, they saved the relegation with goal, um, goal, goal difference. Took up the, took the team, took the job. Uh, trained for two months pre-season. Worked the boys. Uh, teach them new things. Um, we won the league, 
uh, went to the playoffs, won the playoffs uh, in the Mochepe League, first year in that fourth, uh, second year in that, I think also fourth, the third year, half of the season, and I decided, look, maybe it's now time for me to, to move. And that is how it all started for me, you know? Yeah. So when you got to Glendine, do you think that you, there was the same vision that was shared by management with yourself in terms of looking at your, at your coaching journey where you were uh, with Hout Bay, um, looking at the next level of, um, of, of, of participation or of qualifying for, for the next league? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, was, it was always my intention to come back to Glendine to, to, to try to win the league. Um, because that was always the goal of the owner and the, the you know the people that run the club, and then we we you know we said look, let's take two or three years maybe to get there. Um, the first year I got there, um, we did well. Last year we were fourth on the lock, with still 11 games to go, when the league got stopped, and then the team that was on top of the lock was told to go to the playoffs. Um, we were we were seven points behind them. We still had to play them twice. You know, so we were in a good space at the time, you know. But then, you know, sometimes tough decisions get made from the people on top and you got to live with it. Um, and then we started with a new season now we're with the seven teams, you know. And then we, it was it was a goal, you know. We, yeah. we I always tell the players, we, the guys standing here, we pulled this team already from last year already to be in a situation that we are now, you know. Mm -hmm. So we've signed some good professional football players, ex-pros that played in the NFD last season. And some of the boys that have been around the block, some of the boys that have been at Ajax, you know, have good development. So, yeah, we got a good group, you know. Got some, some, some fantastic young players and some fantastic experienced players, you know. Mm. Wow. So you got a mixed bag of, uh, of, of experience with youth and, and you think that will take you far if you're looking at the, at the playoffs. What is your ultimate goal, coach? Do you want to, t you want to win the playoffs? Yeah, we want to win the <laughs> players. We want to win promotion. We want to have four teams in Cape Town in the NFD. Yeah. Um, I think the team is in the right space at the moment. I tell you why, because we got about we got about four or five players that are at 29, 28, 27, and that's the perfect age for for for, for a football player, you know. Um, and then we've got the younger ones, you know. So yeah. we got a few experienced boys and a few very very talented young players, you know. So yeah, we we really are, you know, we're in a good space at the moment, you know. I feel very very confident, you know. I believe that we can. We, we're going to do it, you know. Yeah. yeah. And now it's not going to be easy, but it's doable, you know. Yeah. That's a very difficult uh, competition, uh, the playoffs. And it also brings about an opportunity to football players and to the coaches as well to look at the talent that is at display. And it gives an opportunity to some of the players that, mot that might not gain promotion, but to be identified uh, by some of the top uh, uh, football clubs um, in the country. Yeah, when you go to the playoffs, there's... Um, there's so much, there's a lot of scouts, there's a lot of clubs looking for players and so on. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tournament to go to and to really do well for yourself, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, we the boys are ready, you know, if the opportunity comes up for the boys to, if there's interest or whatever the case may be, then, you know, we're not going to hold anything back. But... We are going there with one clear goal, you know, to to win promotion and to to keep the boys, that, to keep most of the boys that that if we win promotion, the NFD do to you know they can be a part of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. If we look at the ABC Mitsubishi League coach and um, y your involvement so far in coaching, how important is this league in the in the football uh, structures? It's a very very important league for South African because we have nine reasons um you know in you have nine reasons and you have all these clubs playing what overs and under 23 players and the NFD clubs are signing the players from the from the mochepe and sometimes you find the the, the bigger clubs in in, in Zoburg and so on are signing these boys from the mochepe you know they're real real talent the 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 the, 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 the talented ones you know so yeah it's a it's a good stepping stone you know for you to go to the NFD you know, and and you know, you if you do well, then I would assume uh, some one of the NFD clubs will, will will pick you up. You know, so it's a good league for 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 South Africa for younger players that don't get the opportunity to play in the NFD, so you can go there and play there and do very very well, 
and move on, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If we had to talk about your, your football philosophy as a coach, have you picked up any or, uh, you know, there's this whole fascination about football philosophy and game analysis, and I know maybe there isn't much exposure to it um, at this level. Um, do you believe in that, in that system and, uh, and, and how do you make use of it? Yeah, I think football is football, you know, football is it's, it's, it's about entertainment and it's about winning at the end of the day because there's no use going on a Saturday afternoon and playing playing and, and, and drawing or losing and going the next week again and the next week. But then you've got, you've got all the ball, you keep possession of the ball, um, you, you dominate the game, but you don't win the game. So, so what, what kind of education are you giving to your players when you, when you sit with them in a meeting and you tell them how well they've played? how well they've kept the ball, the possession stakes in the game, but you're losing, you know. So I think I'm a big believer in terms of having the ball or not having the ball. It, it Sports and, and football, especially at a certain age, um, it is about winning, you know. It's about winning, you know. If you play under 13 and under 11 and under 7, it's not about winning, it's about enjoyment. It's about developing, it's about enjoyment, it's about getting out of the house on a Saturday morning, going to the field and play and seeing your friends, you know, and so on. But when it comes to a certain age, it, it is about winning, you know. I mean, how do you teach a 16-year-old or 17 or 18-year-old boy just to play? But don't worry about winning, just just play. And at the end of the day, it's football and sports is about winning, you know. Yeah. You know. If we dive deep, coach, and we look at the football development structures, because... What happens at a local football association is what you receive at the top. Um, and I've had different interviews with different coaches uh, where uh, football players, they struggle with a certain technique or a basic technique that is, that is uh, sought to be seen as being taught at a, at a lower level. Do you experience many of those instances? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean many, many times you see young players, you know, um, doing this and doing that wrong, you know, but if you, if you keep on persevering and you keep on working, you know, you can get it right, you know, so, and, and we're so fortunate here in Cape Town that you got so many academies going in Cape Town at the moment that, and these guys are going to all these courses and they're doing a lot of good work with these youngsters, you know, you know, so, yeah, the development structures and the development programs are in Cape Town, you know, it's going very, very well at the moment, you know, yeah. but all these academies at the moment going in Cape Town. I mean, I don't want to mention names. Yeah. Know. But, and, and then you get these things that are happening in the whole of South Africa is um, the private coaching, you know, where you, you, you know, you're going on a Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, and uh, you've got a few coaches that give you pri um, private uh, classes, private coaching lessons, you know. So there's a lot of stuff, stop, st stuff happening at the moment, you know. In yeah. Cape Town. yeah. There's quite a lot of things that are happening, though. And, and, and one looks at, um, at the legacy of the 2010 FIFA World Cup and the amount of money that was injected in the legacy and the plan that was there to have academies by the, by the association. And those academies have not come into, into being. And, and we see the struggle, Coach, uh, because then you'll find that individuals, they start to open up their own private academies. There are good private academies. There are also not so good private academies because you know, they, they promise players the world. And, and when players go in there, you'll find that maybe there are no necessary expertise, but people just want to, to, to run a business uh, promising football players that they will reach their, their ultimate goals. What is your take on how far the Football Association has, has not managed to, to, to establish like a, an academy system uh, that takes care of football players in all the regions? Now looking at Cape Town specifically. Yeah, well, but, you know, as you said, now it, it never it never happened, and I don't think it's ever going to happen. But the clubs and all these academies are doing most of the work, you know. So so they are doing fantastically well, but they are doing most of the work. And what you are saying about this vision that Safa has created, you know, it's um, what what all the reasons that are going to have these academies and. It's going to be like this and it's going to be like that. Well, it never happened and I don't see it happening at the moment because, you know, it's 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 like, you know, it's it's a f it's a far fetched, you know. Yeah. It's far fetched, you know. Yeah. So it's not gonna happen. But all these clubs and all these academies are doing are doing fantastic work here in Cape Town with with these young players and all these coaching 
coaching that goes into it, you know. So they are doing, I mean, a lot of good work, you know, in Cape Town. So unfortunately, the SAFA thing hasn't happened, you know, the vision that they've always spoken about after the 2010. A lot of money was going to go in it, into it, but it, it has never happened, you know, and and that's a sad part, you know. Yeah, that's an unfortunate part. If we, if we had to talk about the conversation that happens within the football space, especially with the with the former football players, is there such a conversation that is taking place? Is there a relationship? Is there, uh, you know, uh, those gatherings where we talk football and we, you know, there's planning that happens around? Because there's always been a perception that former football players are excluded in the in the current conversation of football. Yeah, or it's it's always like that, you know. Like some of the ex players are not involved with with the with, with the associations um, and so on and. And something you know that that's that's yeah that's not going down well with a lot of the guys you know that has played ex players that they are not feel a part of a, a, a part of these all these talks happening at the moment you know so yeah they feel a grief you know that yeah, yeah there's no communication there's no workshops being done there's no converse football conversations happening at the moment you know so yeah it's a it's a tough one. Yeah, no, we'll bring the association into 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 that conversation because there's a lot of expertise that is there um, that requires, you know, the, the 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 support and also give some guidance to the young and upcoming football players because one of the areas that is underlooked um, in the South African context of football is the is the is the psychological part uh, because sometimes players go through a difficult time. And sometimes they do not have someone to share that conversation with in terms of the difficulty that they're experiencing. You know, former football players is one of the people that, you know, that have played a major role in, in, in the football space. But you see, the problem with what, you said, what you're saying now is there's no support structure, man. you know, when all these players and, and even us, you know, even myself, when we have problems and when we have, when we have to deal with things, you know, um, there's no support structure, you know, to for you, you know, to, to help you and so on, you know. The guys have to do things for themselves, you know. Mm. So so that's, yeah, it's hard, you know, that the PSL and SAFA and all the structures or whatever structure hasn't done, hasn't done, hasn't much, hasn't mu helped much, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, coach, we wish you everything of the best for, for the playoffs and, and hopefully you will be crowned. Um, the, the national champions and so that you can qualify for the for the Glad Africa Championship. Yeah, no, we will go there with a lot of confidence and, um, you know, we've got a lot of support behind us from the people in Cape Town and, and, and so on, you know, so we will we will give our best, you know, we will, give, we'll, 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 we will, we will make sure that we come back with a trophy, you know. Yes, coach. And, and yeah, hopefully the boys can do it, you know. Yeah, all the best, coach. Thank, Thank you, you for much. joining us. <laughs>